Welcome, everybody. Um, we are so delighted to have you here for this Reader's Theater, Letters Home from Montanans at War, and to all of you who have agreed to read a part, thank you very much. Um, my name is Martha Cole, and I'm the Outreach and Interpretation Program Manager here at the Montana Historical Society, and um, we are especially pleased that we were able to partner for this program with the American Legion of Montana. So some stage directions before we start. I will be the narrator of today's um, performance. And I am going to call people up by group. So if the Civil War and Philippine American War readers could come up. And as you are called up by group, you will sit in these chairs and I I think I put a number on your part. Uh, so you are civil, if you're Civil War and Philippine American War, come on up and sit down. Sit in the order that you're going to read. Um, and after you finish reading, I'm gonna have you exit this way so no one trips over the cord. So you're gonna get up, you're gonna come read, and then you're gonna walk around this way and return to your seat. All right? And so that's how this is going to work. Does there any questions from any of the readers? I also will say I have a script up here. So I gave you your script just so you could preview things, but you, you could, you'll be reading from this script and we'll be turning these pages. And so we have it all right here. Okay? And with that, let's begin. Welcome to this Reader's Theater presentation of Letters Home from Montanans at War. The script was assembled by archivists at the Montana Historical Society who excerpted a few of the many letters that we have here in our collection. In this first segment, we'll be sharing letters from the Civil War and the Philippine American War. The first letter is from Michigan-born Archibald Simmons, who wrote to his sister Nellie on July 18, 1863, while serving with the Union Army in Tennessee. Nellie saved his letters and Archibald brought them with him when he moved to Montana, where he was the Indian agent at Fort Belknap. Dear sister, you no doubt have heard of our advance before this. We left Murfreesboro June 24th. First day, long towards evening, we fell in with the rebels and had a light brush with them when they commenced their old game that is retreating, which they rather did any day than stand right up to a square fight. They fell back to a place called Hoover's Gap, where they thought they could bring us to a halt. They had chosen a good position. The country around there was very hilly. The way we had to go was between two hills. The rebels had taken their positions on the hills while their batteries were so placed as to have their command in the grass. But the boys that know no fear soon made the butternuts get up and climb. We lost a good many and killed and wounded, and we took a good many prisoners. We thought surely they would give us a battle at Tallahoma where they had fortified so strongly, but we were disappointed. Had it not rained so much, we would have, been outflanked, we would have outflanked them and would have been obliged to fight or surrender. But owing to the rains, it made the roads almost impassable and they were found out what we were trying to do. So we got out of Tallahoma as quick as they could. They tried to get away from their siege guns, but they got stuck in the mud, and they could not get them out, so they burnt their carriages and left them in the mud. We are now, now camped near a place by the name of Deckard, waiting for supplies. We don't know how long it will be before we move. It may be some time, yet deserters are coming in every day from the rebels' ranks. They report that the mountains are full of deserters, mostly Tennesseans who swore that they would not leave the state. I will have to bring my writing to a close on account of nothing of importance to write. Do not forget to write in to tell me all the news. From your affectionate brother, A.O. Simons. The following letter was written by S.M. Keaton, a Confederate prisoner of war at Fort Delaware to his sister Harriet Keaton Smith in Denver on September 19, 1863, 
She brought the letter with her to Virginia City in Montana Territory, where she kept house for her husband. My very dear sister, I will write you a few lines for the last time while I am a prisoner. I hope we are going to leave tomorrow, but I do not know where we are going. Some say we are going to Camp Chase in Ohio. I hope we are going to be exchanged. If not, I will write you when we stop. My dear sister, you must keep in good spirits. I assure you that I will turn up home someday if I live. I have written several letters to you and sent you and Josephine a ring apiece. Oh, how I wish I could get one or two more letters from you. Josephine, my dear and most esteemed friend, I think of you and Hattie a great deal. You must try to be satisfied. I am coming home surely if the Lord spares me. I cannot write any more. Hattie, Lieutenant Stevens Price sends his respects to you and mother. So farewell until you hear from me again. P.S. Sister, since writing the above, I received your letter of the 7th of September this evening at dark and was glad to hear from you once more. Hattie, it is impossible to send you my likeness, but I wish you had sent me yours before I left. Tell Josie, and I, tell Josie that I am ever her well-wisher and that I hope she will marry. Well, tell her to give my best respects to the lucky man, her intended. We will leave in the morning. I am glad to hear you are in Denver a while. Father is gone. I hope you will stay there. Do not look for me until you see me coming. Sincerely, S.M. Keaton. And if we want to take just a quick pause, because I think we have the the colors and the regimental flag that we're gonna bring up to the front. This one should, needs to be, this one needs to be over? Okay. Okay, we're gonna have to move this over so it can match. Thank you. So you want to come up now? Corporal William Yost, a friend of the Hanson family in Butte, Montana, fought in the Spanish-American War in the Philippines in 1899. Not much is known about William aside from his letters to Montana. Yost's letters were sent to Hilma Hansen, daughter of Pete and Anna Hansen. Peter Hansen was the foreman of a smelter company in Butte where Yost had worked. Hilma herself graduated from Garfield School in Butte and worked as a teacher in the Coloma mining town in 1896. This was written on board the NS Hospital Ship Relief, Manila Bay, May 5, 1899.
Dear Hilma, please excuse this paper, but it is all I can manage to find and I'm lucky to have it as writing material is a scarce article here at present. Yes, I did succeed at last in getting shot and with an old time brass bullet at that. It happened on the evening of the 27th about 10 o'clock. It struck me in the left hip. Entering in the front, it struck the hip bone and glanced downward, passing through the thigh and lodged just half an inch under the shin at the rear from where the field surgeon removed it. I couldn't realize for a moment that I had been shot. It felt much more like standing on a railroad and getting knocked off by the Lightning Express. I let a yelp out of me and slapped my hand over, over the place in my trousers where it entered. Then the doctor and litter bearers came up. The doctor had that old slug cut out, a bandage put on, and was off to the next one quicker than you could wink. Then I crawled onto the litter and got a full ride back to the road where they dumped me off to wait for an ambulance to put in its appearance. I was lying by the side of the river when a bullet threw up a cloud of dust about three feet from me. So of course that was no place for me. I didn't stop to ask any questions, but pulled myself off into the bushes out of sight where I lay until eight o'clock. In the meantime, an ambulance had passed by, but I failed to attract their attention, or else they were already loaded. But I sure got a berth in the next one, and after it got a load, which didn't take long, it started for the railroad, and you talk about your rides. I don't care for another such as that very soon. There was one poor fellow next to me who was shot through the neck and didn't have any shirt. So I gave him mine, as I had an undershirt left, but that poor fellow suffered untold agonies. We finally reached the train and were loaded into boxcars, lying on cots, which was a great relief to most of us. We were brought into Manila as quick as possible. There, we transferred to the river launches and were taken up the river to the first reserve hospital. Arrived here, we were laid out in rows under the trees awaiting our time on the operating table. It was not a very pleasant sight by any means. 61 wounded, some of them covered with their own blood from head to foot. And way down at the foot of the line lay five silent forms covered with blankets, which told plainer than words that they would not need the operating tables. And during the next week, five of the others had their last sleep. My friend who was shot in the neck died the second night in the hospital. He was a brave young fellow, handsome and courageous, always cheerful, even up to the last. On the 25th, they sent 16 of us to this boat, and I am not sorry either, as this is the nicest place I have been in since I joined the Army. It is a regular floating palace with nearly all the modern improvements. We have the finest kind of a breeze and no mosquitoes, which is a godsend as on shore the air is so bad that every time you draw your breath you run big risks of scorching your lungs and at night the mosquitoes carry you away by sections. Then again, we have a lovely view of the whole bay and of Manila for a background. Yost continues to describe two of his good friends in his company, George and Guy. Our poor little com company had got more than its share of the hard fighting. Out of 48 men, we have lost four, killed, and 14 wounded, with a good prospect of losing more before this thing is settled, but I sincerely hope it won't be George and Guy. Yes, we are, laying down our lives for a noble cause, but I have only one life to lay down, and when that is gone, I'll be out of a job. Regards to your father and mother, to the boys and all the rest of my friends, goodbye for this time hoping we may be home before the snow falls. I remain your sincere friend, Will. If I could have group two, World War I, come up. We will be sharing letters from World War I by and about Joseph Porter Toole. Joseph Porter Toole was the son of former Montana Governor Joseph K. Toole and Lily Rosencrantz Toole. He was called into service December 3, 1917 from the Officers Reserve Corps, organized under the National Defense Act of 1916, and received his training at the Presidio in San Francisco. Commissioned as a first lieutenant of infantry, 
he was assigned to Company D, 364th Infantry Regiment, as part of the 91st Infantry Division, known as the Pine Tree Division or Wild West Division. He arrived in France on July 12, 1918, and served with distinction during the saint Miel and Meuse-Argonne offenses in the fall of 1918. Here are excerpts from one of his letters home. This letter is titled, On Active Service, November 28, 1918. Dearest mother and father, your prayers and thoughts are with me. That is what your letters tell me, and that is why I'm safe and well this Thanksgiving evening, as I write to you by the candlelight in a room recently occupied by a German officer in a city that has been shelled and looted by the hellish Huns. That your prayers and thoughts have been with me has helped me to do things that I might otherwise have faltered in doing. I thought of you in your prayers yesterday when I marched the company down the street and as a little priest chanting, headed a funeral approached, mother with tears in her eyes, I gave thanks that you were spared such grief. You will never know how close death came to one who loves you and longs to be with you again. I believe that every man in the company thought of his parents as the little procession passed by and breathed in the same thanksgiving that was on my lips and in my heart at that moment. Further into the letter, Tool mentions that his parents had asked for details about how he was wounded in action. He provides a brief account. On the morning of September 28th, we were again the leaders of the attack. We had many machine gun nests to contend with. There were many casualties. Our battalion stopped a German counterattack, and then one company led an attack on the strong point held by the Germans. It was in this rush that I was hit by a machine gun bullet and sent spinning on my ear. I was taken back about half, a half mile and there lay overnight in the rain until the stretchers got me in the morning and I started back through the chain of dressing stations and evacuation hospitals that finally sent me to, the, to base number six Bordeaux. I must close now with much love and best wishes for you, your loving son, Jody. Unbeknownst to Lieutenant Toole, his friends also shared the story with his parents. Toole's mom and dad first learned the details of the incident from a letter Toole wrote to a schoolmate, Lieutenant David Rowan. Lieutenant Rowan shared that letter with the press and it was published in the Helena Independent on November 5, 1918, a little uh, over a month after Toole was wounded. Here's a short excerpt. The major ordered me to rush the strong point with my company. We got it, but they got me on the last rush. A machine gun bullet went through my left arm and shoulder and stuck its nose out just behind the shoulder blade in my back. One of the corporals, God bless him, dropped by my side and cut my blouse off. I told him I thought I felt the bullet still in my back. He found it and cut it out for me. Then he left me and I forgot just what happened for a while. Six months later, the tools received another letter. This one was from Captain Charles Boucher, Jr., Company D, 364th Infantry, Regiment 91 Infantry Division, writing from St. Georges du Rosé, France, Sunday, 2nd, March, 1919. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Toole, through chance I have been in close association with your son Joe since, since his enlistment in Uncle Sam's forces to the present time, and for fear the praise due my pal, as I term him, will never reach you, otherwise I take the liberty of this letter. I was in the fight beside Joe, and I want to say he was an officer and leader who deserves a bit of mention to you at home. When our forces were a bit shattered by some severe shelling, Joe was placed in command of a company not his own and led them into battle. Then he reverted to his own company 
and I was nearby when he was ordered to forward under deadly machine gun fire. He went readily and was doing bravely the severest task that ever confronts a man in battle when he was wounded. He did not receive a medal, nor did he receive a promotion, but he gained the highest esteem and regard from his fellow officers, and I will almost, I will say almost the love and worship of the men of Company D, and that is the biggest reward of all. If Group 3, World War II, could come forward, please. In this segment, we'll be sharing letters from World War II. The first is from Lieutenant Irene Wold, who grew up in Butte, Montana. She joined the Army Nurse Corps in 1943. She was stationed in North Africa from 1943 to 1944, and then in France. This letter is dated North Africa, September 19, 1943. Dear Mom, Marge, Eric, George, and Bess. Today, Sunday, everything is very quiet in the wards. Boys are all quiet. No rough play so far. It's certainly different taking care of these kids. They really appreciate things done for them. What they enjoy most, and they denied themselves, admit, does them most good is to have an American nurse to talk to. We listen to them, talk about the battlefront. They can't write about it and have to get it off their chest some way. There's an Italian boy from New York in my ward. He has a long first name, and for short, he's always been called Buddy. I came in the other morning and just nonchalantly in passing said, Hi, Bud. He wrote a letter later to his mother and told her about it. He said it sounded to him so much like he used to be called at home, and he hadn't heard it for so long. He told her it was the highest morale builder he had had for a long time. It's just simple little kindnesses sometimes that help so much. After briefly mentioning a recent dance she attended and pleading with her mother to send her some warm pajamas, Irene continues. Mom, will you get the September American magazine and send it to me? There's a picture in it of Captain Douglas Smith, who is the world's leading guerrilla warfighter. I got to know him quite well on the ship. He embarked in New York with us. He used to call me Margot, and I couldn't figure a reason why. I told him time and again my right name was Irene, and he'd always say, yes, I know, but I prefer to call you Margot. Anyway, later, after we arrived in Africa, he stayed in the same vicinity. Irene continues to describe an encounter with Captain Smith as he introduced her to another captain. He called me Lieutenant Margot. I again reminded him of my right name, and he broke down and said, before he met me, when he first saw me, I reminded him of Margot, the screen and stage star. I just laughed at him. To me, it was very funny. He gave a two-hour lecture that night on the boat to all officers and nurses. He told us all about the guerrilla warfare he'd led in the desert. When he left here, he had a conference in the near future with General Eisenhower to discuss it, the next assignment. Since being here, I've met General Roosevelt, son or nephew of Teddy Roosevelt. I was with a group of officers at the villa, and he was there with the Marquis of Morocco and his wife. The general invited us to join their party. He's also a most interesting person, having been all over the world. We all chatted together for about an hour and drank some wine with him. One meets people from all over the world, people of once fame and otherwise. Down deep inside, though, we're all alike, 
all fighting for same cause and freedom for our families, friends, and allies, for the preservation of the generations to follow us. It isn't helping our generation too much, considering the number of our boys that are dying in the battlefield and keeping old glory flying in all the corners of the globe. Guess I've gone on and on, but one thing we've all discovered after this war is over and we're all back home again among us, there will be less griping and more appreciation for the simple things that all our lives we've expected and taken for granted. I don't regret leaving though. I'm glad for it to see how other peoples of the world live and the manner in which they derive happiness out of life. Love and kisses, Irene. Mark D. Hokum was born in Missouri in 1907. He taught school in Missouri for a time and then went to medical school. After graduating from medical school, he did his internship at St. James Hospital in Butte. He then set up a medical practice in Whitefish where he worked until enlisting in the 163rd Infantry Regiment during World War II. He served with his regiment in the Pacific Theater, including in Papua New Guinea and the Philippines. This letter t is to his wife, dated June 20th, 1944. We are still at it hot and heavy, as you may surprise some more, <coughs> some eyes from listening to the radio. Last night, while listening to the radio, Tokyo, Tokyo, incidentally, an artillery shell hit 30 feet from me. A few got peppered, but no serious wounds. A kid from Norborn, Missouri, sitting by me, got a few souvenirs. I'll write his family, whom I knew while teaching school there, and assure them he is okay. Didn't send any to the hospital. Don't think one doesn't hug the ground when the whistling about three feet over your hole. Someone, uh, somehow I always manage to think of you and the kids at such times. Everybody laughs and jokes at such times, so our morale can't be too bad. At least we can take it as well as we can dish it out. Bucky Moore and Hanson Whitefish were close by and didn't get a scratch, so Whitefish Luck is still holding out. Duff is back with us and doing okay. I got a, the prize dugout of the battalion about two feet deep in solid coral, built up and covered with sandbags. The mold is getting a bit thick, but it is pretty good sleeping. Slept like a baby last night. I had been picking up shells which I hope will ultimately reach you most of the afternoon. Finished up with about an hour's swim, so had all the muscles pretty well relaxed. Dr. Holcomb writes this letter dated June 22, 1944, likely in response to a question from his wife. <laughs> As for my job, it varies. In one of the four beachheads I held established in one month, I went in with one company in the first wave. Resistance was light, so casualties were light. I did sew up a sucking wound on the chest <coughs> on the beach under gunfire, and I was scared. I gave the same man a plasma unit, which I <coughs> meant I stayed there for about a half an hour. I'm in a hole, of course. <clears throat> Pigs can be quite a nuisance at such times, also the dogs. Brothers John and Robert Harrison were raised in Harleton, Montana. They both joined the U.S. Reserves and during World War II served in Europe. John Harrison was stationed on Utah Beach, coordinating efforts to identify and bury the Americans lost in the invasion of Normandy and later investigating war atrocities against U.S. servicemen. Robert served in the 101st Airborne Division and its efforts during D-Day and the Battle of the Bulge. This letter is from John C. Harrison to his father on January 16, 1944. 
1945 from Belgium regarding news of younger brother Bob Harrison, who is declared missing in action. This is going to be pretty rough medicine for you, old timer. But things being as they are, I think we had better face the facts. Bob is missing in action. There are things giving us hope, and there are others that look bad. Bob's unit was thrown into the defense of Bascon on 18 December. They were overrun by 10 Tiger tanks and infantry. From that time on, the picture gets a bit dim. After three days, all but 20 of the company got back to division. Some reported, but this has not been verified, nor am I writing this to mother. They saw Bob get hit. In the confusion, nothing more was seen. Several things may have happened. First, Bob is a prisoner of war and unwounded. If so, his chances are 70-30 because he was not taken by the SS troops. Second, he may be wounded, and if so, his wounds may determine how he makes out. They took the division medics the next day, so he could have been loaded after them. If so, his chances are 80-20. Third, if he does not show up as a prisoner of war or killed in action in the next 90 days, he'll it will mean that the Krauts murdered him. I am working through the Red Cross and military channels. I'm sorry, old timer, but keep your chin up, for our Irish luck may still be with us. Your loving son, John. After two weeks, Robert writes his father, January 25th, 1945, from the POW camp, Germany. Well, old man, here I am in a permanent camp or stolog. So when this letter makes the rounds, let all know they can write me here. Wait the war out. Waiting the war out is tedious but not dangerous. Lord, though it makes one think of home. Be believe the wanderlust is gone. Had so much time to evaluate what I want, what I want, and it all adds up to Montana and my family. The family then goes nearly three months without any more news, but in a letter from John Harrison, Harrison to his wife, China, on April 23, 1945, he shares news that Bob's camp may have been liberated. Of course, the news of Bob is the most wonderful thing that has happened in a long time. I am now trying to contact Third Army to find out if he has been liberated. Troops overran that area where his flag was located several days ago. If he is liberated, he will be sent home just as soon as transportation can be provided. So it's quite possible that he is on the way. Of course, there's a chance that he that the crowds evacuated the camp, but the way our troops were traveling, the likelihood is slim. While I was in London and Paris, I tried to find out all I could about Bob, but they say he is still missing in action. Finally, John wrote to the family on May 14, 1945, Germany, conveying news of Bob's death. Please forgive me for writing this one letter to you all, but I do not want to have to sit down and write each one of you individually. In fact, I just do not think that I have it in me to say more than once what I have to say now. By the time you have, <clears throat> by the time you have this letter, you will have heard from the War Department I received the letter from the adjutant last evening and have been so shocked by the news that I hardly know just what to write. I have my, asked myself a hundred times, why? Why couldn't he have waited? I'm sitting here trying to work it all out by, for myself, 
but will try to help you see the picture. In the first place, it is like him to decide that he had enough pushing around from the crowds, and he decided that he was coming home. So when the opportunity presented itself, he just took off. The only thing wrong with the idea was it was too soon. Germany was officially liberated in early May 1945. The following is an extract from the official report of Corporal Granville Armel, who was with Bob on the escape. On the evening of 6 April 1945, Lieutenant Harrison and I escaped near Bergfindheim, Germany. Around 200 hours, 11 April, on the Erbrock Würzburg Highway, we started across a bridge about 13 kilometers west of Erbach. Just as we reached the center of the bridge, a German sentry fired on us. Lieutenant Harrison, who was leading, was hit and died instantly. I realize that nothing I say can soften the blow, nor do I know just what to think. After that terrible long wait, when we're all holding back our thoughts, and with the wonderful news that Bob was a prisoner of war, this seems too cruel a blow. Like all of you, it has taken my very breath away and left me numb. Now I want to talk to you as I no, Bob would want me to, and as I would have wanted if someone, something had happened to me. There's nothing in the world that can change what, that which has happened, and though we will miss him more than any of us can tell, we must go on and live our lives. I cannot tell you how much I was worried about each and every one of you. Being so far from home, I felt completely helpless in this emergency. And though I would give anything in the world to be with you now, this is impossible. If anything should happen to any of you, if any one of you should be sick from worry, it would be just about more than I could take. Right now I need the strength and all the good news that you can give me from home. Ours is a family strong in love for one another, and that strength is going to help us get over this rough spot. I have hopes that in not too distant future, we can be together again. A few years ago, the country needed me more than even my family. But now, after four and a half years in the service, I feel that I have done my job. I promise that if possible, I will come home. In the meantime, you must carry on and wait for what happens next. My love and every thought is with you, your loving son, John. Butte native John Pat Blinn. Do we have Butte native John Pat Blinn anywhere? Jeff Malcolmson, I nominate you. The person with the John Pat Blinn must have left. Butte native John Pat Blinn served 34 months uh, Marine service in World War II, including campaigns in Tarawa, Saipan, Guam, and Iwo Jima. The letter is one he wrote while in Iwo Jima, where he served in the support troops, 5th Amphibian Corps. This is from a letter dated March 14th, 1945, Iwo Jima. Oh, you're there. I didn't see you. Sorry, <laughs> you didn't come up. Come on up. <laughs> I was looking. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> Hello, darling. I'm writing on the edge of my foxhole. I'm writing on the edge of my foxhole as I write this. The guns are pounding away, and to top it off, I don't think of a. I can't think of a darn thing to say. Pardon me while I light my pipe. Betsy, I feel like a heel. You've been so swell about writing, and I've been so negligent. I have an excuse for not writing. That's what baffles me. Every time I get a blank piece of paper in front of me, 
my mind just gets blank. That's, that psychiatry course you are taking will come in darned handy when we finally get together. Things are tough all over, even on I Iwo Jima. Golly, another blank sheet. Gee, Snooks, thanks a lot for those snaps. You look just as sweet as you did two years ago. Keep them coming. They're great for my morale. When the weather gets warmer, how about some in a bathing suit? <laughs> Say, when do you and DJ go to Butte? Drop off and see my mums. Should be glad to see you. <clears throat> this darn pen has so much sand in it, the darn thing clogs up every five letters or so. Well, Betsy, I'm going to change to a pencil. This pen is driving me crazy. Much better, at least I think so. The dust and sand on this rock is terrific. If we stay here much longer, I'll go sand sappy. And some things as the same thing as jungle jolly, only we, only we know jungle. Golly, it's been a long time since we've seen each other. Just another 18 or 20 months and I'll be back for 30 days. 30 short days. Isn't that wonderful? After that, I'll more than likely be right out here again. Well, Snooks, I'm going to secure this. I've got some work to do. Take care of yourself, darling, and keep on writing. All my love, Pat. Private first class Pat Blinn had a hard time readjusting to civilian life. He had re-enlisted April 1950 and was killed in action with the 5th Regiment of the 1st Marine Division in the fighting against North Korean armies in Changjin uh, Reservoir area on December 2, 1950. Unfortunately, his remains are still missing. May I ask Group 4, Korean War, Vietnam War, and Operation Iraqi Freedom to come up, please. This letter from the Korean War era was written by Major John W. McDonald. John was born in 1928 in the Philippines where his parents were missionaries. He and his family experienced war early in life when the Japanese invaded their island home in December 1941, beginning American involvement in World War II. He and his family suffered internment during the war. After the war, John graduated from Missoula County High School attended the University of Montana, and then enlisted in the U.S. Army Air Force for pilot training. He flew propaganda and transport missions during the Korean War. His letters from Korea reveal that he saw his service in the war not as a duty per se, but more as a good job that paid a decent salary for a young man. More than anything, it allowed him to fly planes, something he obviously loved. Here's one of his letters written to his brother, Bob McDonald, on May 29th, 1952. Dear Bob, I'm if my writing is loused up in this letter, it's because the plane is bouncing all over the sky. There's a hellacious wind blowing and it makes all sorts of turbulence over the mountains here. It would be a lot smoother up at nine or 10,000 but I'd have a stronger headwind up there too. So I'll stay low till I come to the central range of the mountains, then I'll climb on top of the clouds, plus turbulence. I'm on my second trip from Seoul, I'm on my second trip to Seoul from Pusan today, and it will and we'll come back again to Busan before I'm through today. Your letter plus picture, damn but it's rough as a cob, got, got to me this morning. That's a pretty good picture. George, like he's getting fat, he'll have a double chin pretty soon if he doesn't watch out. From his frequent letters, I gather he's fairly happy. To the hell with those bumps, I'm going up on top back later. I'm now at 8,500 and it's still rough, but not too bad, so I'll probably stay here. So you're getting out in October. What then? Just caught an updraft up to 10,500 feet. Smooth here, so I'll stay. 
You have never mentioned what you plan to do after you get discharged. I do imagine, I don't imagine you feel like teaching anymore. You didn't seem to like it much. Photography, writing, or can't you decide that like me? Are you going back to Missoula to live? You mentioned going home in October. Any plans for marriage? If I'm getting nosy, just say so. I'd like to get married, but I don't know who, and I'm afraid I'd be easy pickings for some gal. Oh well, such is life. Going to quit now, plus write a note to George. See you this fall, John. John McDonald stayed in the Air Force into the 1960s and served in Japan during the Vietnam War. He retired from the Air Force with 20 years service. He then ta taught at Sentinel High School in Missoula before retiring to Stevensville. The next letter is not a letter at all. It's a diary from the Vietnam War. But perhaps we should think of it as a soldier's letter to himself and to future generations. Gerald Simpson was born in 1943 at the height of World War II. His father, Orville, worked for the PV Company flour mills in Billings. At age 20 in 1963, Jerry joined the United States Marine Corps as a cook. As part of the first major U.S. military buildup in Vietnam, the 3rd Marine Division, including Jerry Simpson, was deployed to Da Nang in the summer of 1965. Jerry writes in his first entry on May 5th, 1965, the day they embarked from San Diego. We were supposed to go to Japan, Korea, the Philippines, and operate out of Okinawa. Some people feel we may, some feel we may end up in South Vietnam. God only knows what lies ahead. Jerry often mentions his girlfriend, Rita, back home in Billings. On May 24th, 1965, he writes, Rita wrote me a Dear John last night. She feels she would rather have a career than marriage. She asked me to go see her next June before I become involved. The trouble is, I'm involved. Why did? And then he doesn't write anymore that day. In his next entry, his next entry is not until June 29th. We finally mounted out for Vietnam. I don't really care. I quit caring last month. Some of us won't be coming back. We're supposed to be back in Okinawa in September. July 7th, 1965, arrived in Da Nang, South Vietnam, no resistance. The temperature is 120 degrees. We are now about three miles from the airstrip. Man, I am shook. Didn't think I would be. On September 1st, 1965, when he had expected to return to Okinawa, Jerry simply states, Well, we're still here, and we are, we are to be here for a long while. October 17, 1965, Rita wrote and said she loves me. She said forever isn't too long. Man, I am the luckiest and happiest guy alive. My life now has a purpose and meaning to it. I love her so very much. I hope and pray I never let her down and can make her happy. February 21st, 1966. I have been in a very low frame of mind for the past 24 hours. As yesterday, in a letter from Rita, she told me of a date with some other guy. I was hurt, angry, and jealous. Though the hurt and jealousy still remain, the anger has cooled, as I do love her. She told me about it, and that counts for something. I believe she loves me. It will take more than one little rough spot to break us up. This can only serve to strengthen our love. Sweep tomorrow. February 27th, 1966. Gunnery Sergeant Gardner told me I am going to Hill 22 tomorrow. Lima Company is on the hill. I can't help but feel a little shook as, I, as over there is where the war is. Yet that's why I'm being paid the combat pay. Didn't hear from Rita today, of course. Rita today. Of course, I would like to, like to every day. As I looked at her picture, she was the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. I wanted her to step out of the picture into my arms. I love her so much and need her. On 
On March 6, 1966, Jerry reflects. Since being overseas, I have seen how wasteful Americans are when it comes to eating. We have, it, we have had it so good. About 11 or 11.30 p.m., caught two VC probing the lines. Lance Corporal Meyer died. Damn VC got, tw damn VC, got 20 VC for him. Wasn't worth his life. Ten days later, this place is beginning to really get me down. Home seems a million miles away, and like I'll never get there. Today, I feel really let down. The U.S. Army sent out a three-man pacification team to talk to the villagers around here. They have talked to these people for over a year and are no better off than before. But he ends that day's entry by writing, Heard from Rita today. I wish I could be with her. The love I feel for her could never be the same for any other woman. June 27th, 1966. Today will be my last entry in this diary after one year, one month, and 12 days of writing. I wish I had been more diligent about this thing. We have left Salt Lake City and Jackson Hole and are 15 minutes from home. This last year has left its mark on five, 598 of us from the 2nd Battalion. 9th Marine Regiment. That is all that made it home. I was lucky. They better think twice before trying to send me back over there. I hate that damn hole and sure as hell I'm not going back. They will get over it. I will never forget such people as Lance Corporal Larry Chadwick, Private First Class Howard Loven, Corporal Harold Rains, Private First Class Tom Reed, First Lieutenant Richard Williams, a marauder, and First Lieutenant Jim Palmer. These are men who were bastard, bastards by Marine Corps standards because, because they disliked the Corps but got the job done. Howard was one of the casualties, having received second and third degree burns last September. We'll look him up when I return to the West Coast. He was also the youngest, just turned 18. There's nothing more to say. God, it's grand to be back. Jerry returned to Billings, where he married Rita. Together, they had two children and eventually moved to California. This last excerpt is from an email rather than a letter, a testament to changing technology. Captain Corey Swanson of Helena, who served in Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom, sent the email to the Montana National Guard historian on May 3rd, 2005. Subject, Eye of the Storm. Oddly, we have been through so many crises already that now we all act coolly, quickly, and efficiently. I have been able to channel my worry and intensity into a calm delivery because I have found everyone around me responds and works better when I do. It is like being in the eye of the storm, knowing all is swirling around you. Three nights ago, the storm hit us. An IED detonation killed a soldier and wounded four others in the blink of an eye. Immediately after a massive storm, literally, hit us and the patrols going out to help couldn't even see. We were calm, efficient, tough, and professional, but we still had a dead soldier we couldn't bring back. The young staff sergeant who led that patrol was extraordinary, beyond what is expected of a soldier. When we were done that night, he could no longer hold back the tears and he broke down in the safety of the battalion aid station among his teammates. We have had many days like that where I felt myself being taken to the edge and stretched and strengthened in a way only blood and fire can do. Unfortunately, we will probably have many more. When I first came here, I saw and wrote of all the good in Iraq. It is still teeming with promise, pregnant with potential, but I don't think many of us will leave our hearts behind here. We pour our hearts out for each other, and by the grace of God, we will all return safely home. It is the workaday men and women who make history. Though generals may make the big decisions, it is the individual men and women with families at home who are asked to do the work in war. Thank you for joining us to remember these veterans, and um, thank you to all of our readers who gave us a glimpse into the lives of Montanans at war. <laughs>